There are four things we look forward to at this time of the semester. First, the end of the church year and the beginning of the new church year. This Sunday is the last Sunday of the church year, and the new church year begins with the season of Advent, the preparation of the coming of our Lord, born in a manger. The end of the church year is close, but is not quite here yet. The second thing we look forward to this time of the year is our Lord's return. As the church year draws to a close, we hear all the readings about the end times. Last week we heard about the parable of the ten virgins, the five foolish ones, the five wise ones, as the bridegroom comes to take his bride. This week we heard about the parable of the talents, the master who gives out the talents five, two, one, and then returns to settle accounts. And so it is that at the end of the church year, we are focused on our Lord's second coming when he will come to judge the living and the dead. He could come before I finish this sermon, but I say, no, not yet, Lord. I did all this work. I'm not done yet. (laughs) He could come right before you eat dessert on Thanksgiving Day. No, not yet, Lord. Dessert is the best part. As my pastor friend often says, eat dessert first, for you never know when the Lord will return. (laughs) He could come right before your final exams begin. No, not yet, Lord. I spend all this time studying, and that's not fair. If you're going to do that, then you should have come before I put in all that work. No matter when he comes or will come, we seem to think that we know the timing that would be best for him to return. If he delays in his second coming, the church here just rolls right along, still focusing on the coming of our Lord, but as a babe in a manger. And of course, always focusing on his coming to us daily in the gospel and the sacraments. Our Lord's second coming is near, but as of right now, it's not quite here yet. The third thing we look forward to this time of the year is the end of the semester. Things come to an end, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. With the busyness of the end of the semester, it is easy to forget about the bridegroom who is coming to get his bride. But the end of the semester is near but not quite yet here. The fourth thing some of you look forward to is the end of the sermon. It is close, but is not quite yet here, (laughs) for no one knows that day or hour. (laughs) We don't know which of these four things will come first, the end of the church year, the second coming of our Lord, the end of the semester, or the end of this sermon. And thus our Lord teaches us to be prepared, that is, to trust in Him, not ourselves or the things of this world. Our text today is from the book of Psalms, where our Lord asks us to trust in Him alone. And the text is summarized by the first and last verse. The Lord is our dwelling place, our refuge in all generations. And the psalmist then ends by saying, Teach us to number our days as you have numbered them, Lord, that we may get a heart of wisdom. How did the Lord number our days in this psalm so that we may have that heart of wisdom? Well, we're told he returns man to dust. And death is a picture as a return to the dust out of which God created Adam. He sweeps away our days as with a flood. They are like a dream that just floats away. We are brought to an end by his anger. He has set our sins before him, and all our days pass away under his wrath. 
In contrast to this brief and fleeting human life, which we are always tempted to trust in, God is our dwelling place. God is our refuge for all generations. He is the one to go to for security, for he is before creation and will be for all eternity. That certainly is not how we number our days. We want to make sure we live forever, all right, and that our security is found through the works of our hands and the material things around us. Thus we think ourselves to be wise, and we have no need of the Lord as our dwelling place or refuge. The parable we heard yesterday so aptly illustrates this psalm. God is not fair, and thankfully he is not. Otherwise, we would all get what we deserve, eternal damnation. There is no equality in five talents, two talents, one talent. And a talent is a hefty chunk of money, a fair piece of change at least worth a thousand days' wages for a common laborer or even more. Thus, our Lord is not at all cautious in the way he dishes out his gifts, lavishly bestowing them. And then, quite foolishly, he just goes off with a simple word, carry on. I know undergraduates who wish their parents treated them that way. There was one student at another university who found that on her dorm floor she was the only one whose mother had not insisted that she must go on the pill. That daughter wrote a beautiful letter to her mother. Thanks for trusting me. Something terrific was going on and growing between that mother and daughter. Trusting is risky business. It's much safer and shrewder to trust nobody. Then you can't be disappointed when you are let down or betrayed. If you defend something in that way, though, someday you will look for it and it won't be there, or it really won't be worth much at all in the end. Our beginning is when God shares his talent for creating with a man who begets and a woman who conceives. They become a father and a mother, and we become a son or a daughter. And father and mother are given to do our Father God's caring for us and nurturing us into adults, that is, loving us. Parents do not love all children equally. To love someone is to meet their needs. Thus, how parents love each child is different because the needs of each child are different. Parents may start all children off with piano lessons, but to keep them all at it equally can be tyranny. Perhaps only one child has been given that particular talent. Our talk of talents and being talented comes from the parable we heard yesterday and the danger is to forget who it is who gives us the talents, and then they end up following short of entering into God's joy. You have entered into CUW, and a most vital gift in coming to the university is the opportunity to test your talent, identify it, then multiply it. On Parents Weekend, we are reminded of what has come to us through our parents who have been God's caretakers for us. And this morning again, we acknowledge our Lord as the astonishing giver of gifts and talents. They are His, and He entrusts them to us to use and to enjoy, and gladly to show what all we make and do with them, our worship. And He has a whole lot more up His sleeve that we grow toward by using and enjoying the ones we have now. God loves to pour out his gifts without calculation, without equalization, without quantification. But such bounty is hard to bear for shriveled sinners who refuse to receive gifts, but who insist on taking over and getting control. Part of controlling is a measuring of quantities that's based on comparison of sizes, Instead of receiving gifts from him, we measure what we have as if it were our own. 
If it is more than somebody else's, we are pleased and proud. That is why it is so important to have some people around who are clearly, by some yardstick or other, inferior to us. Or the yardstick we may use may show that we have received a raw deal, whereupon we may sulk or move on quickly to point out whose fault it is, our parents or God. As the man with one talent said yesterday, he is a hard man. If you make him into a hard man who infringes on your rights, who demands what he has the right to demand, then that's how you will receive it from him. You will get what you deserve. We make God our enemy when we clutch what we have as our own for ourselves. Then he is a threat to us. Others are too against whom we must protect ourselves in what we have. And that is the way of losing even what we do have, and finally ourselves too. But that's not what God wants. He wants to be pouring out more of his gifts. Faith is receiving his gifts. And because these gifts are from him, they are for our good, not because we lay on them and on him some yardstick so we can measure everything up and quantify it and produce that it is somehow satisfactory or unsatisfactory. No yardstick, no measurement can cope with five, two, and one. So much for the foolish measuring. Measuring and comparing are not the ways of love. You are not loved because you are like or unlike somebody else. You are loved in Christ. And why on earth God would love somebody like you or me is a question that has its answer only in Him. We can't work out the five, two, and one. We do know that they are all from God, and His love we cannot doubt, for it is the love that went through Calvary for each one of us. He has only one of you, You are irreplaceable. Envying and trying to duplicate someone else runs counter to his love. That is true even of trying to duplicate Jesus as if he were our example and we are to be like him. God doesn't want a whole lot of little Jesuses running around. He has one and only one. He wants one of you. Five, two, and one, then, are not so much a lot, a less, and a little bit, but each one different. And so it is that God loves us uniquely, and thus he gives his gifts to us to be used for one another. The differences matter to God. He loves each one of us in a different way and with a different delight. You are his, whether you are Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. Yet no one of us is the same as any other to the Lord. We are not all equal to God. He loves us uniquely as we all have different needs and he gives us his gifts uniquely. Five, two, and one. Gifts, gifts, gifts. Not so much bigger and smaller, but all different and uniquely precious. So we ask the Lord to forgive us and teach us to number our days as he has numbered them, not trusting in ourselves or material things, but trusting only in him, not wanting him to be fair, but rather deal with us according to his grace, not wanting to get control of what he has given us as if it were our own and thus trying to protect it from him and others, but to receive all things as gifts from him, our gracious giver, to be used for his glory and the benefit of our neighbor. In this, he grants us a heart of wisdom that knows that only he is our dwelling place in all generations, and that from everlasting to everlasting, he is our God.
In the holy name of Jesus, amen.